supported statewide by the Alma Gibbs Doshian Foundation, the Wyndham Foundation, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the Vermont Department of Libraries. Tonight's talk is specially underwritten by Otto and Associates. The Historical Society and the Library would very much like to thank our generous underwriters, um, without whom their support we could not be here tonight. The Boatwright Foundation, the Friends of the Norwich Public Library, the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, the Norwich Historical Society, Mascoma Bank, Norwich Square Properties, and Jane W. Stetson and E. William Stetson III. Tonight's speaker, David Hertzberg, is Associate Professor of History at SUNY Buffalo. He is a historian of drugs and addictive medicines with a particular interest in pharmaceutical sedatives, stimulants, and narcotics in the 20th century's, century's consumer culture. Among other places, his work has appeared in American Quarterly, the American Journal of Public Health, the Bulletin of the History of Medicine, and in a book, Happy Pills in America, From Milltown to Prozac, published by John Hopkins in 2009. Um, he also is a hometown boy. Welcome him back to Norwich. Thank you very much, David Hertzberg. I've got more microphones than I can shake a stick at, so give me a second here while I try to turn them on. Mm. No, hang on. I, I, I'm sure I can get it. I believe in myself. Uh, Oh, the TV one. Usually it's mic'd up. Yeah. yeah. Nobody mm. misses right now. Okay. You got it. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks for uh, coming out tonight. It's it's cold, um, and uh, I want to give a little bit of an a, advance warning that I I brought a my 11 year old son, which means that I gave him my phone to entertain himself while the rest of you suffer through my talk, that means that I don't know what time it is. And so I'm going to try to keep this to the amount of time that it's supposed to be. Uh, but um, if I seem to be going long, you can, you can wave your hand <laughs> and, uh, and I'll speed up. OK. So if you, uh, if you watch the news looking for news about drugs today, which I do because this is what I study, You'll find one of, um, on any given day, one of two broad kinds of stories. On the one hand, obviously, you see stories about the opioid crisis. And a lot of critics say that the opioid crisis began because regulation of pharmaceutical industry was too weak. Uh, and you can see here Andrew Kolodny from the Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing. He's someone associated with this perspective. You might also see more recently uh, articles about um, uh, booming sales of benzodiazepines, like tranquilizers, like Valium and Xanax and Clonopin, and also amphetamine, like Adderall and uh, amphetamine-like drugs like Ritalin. And this is all, these are, uh, the origins of these crises relate to regulations that are too weak. Another kind of story that you might see is the problem of mass incarceration. Uh, in other words, the astounding, astounding number of Americans who are either in prison, uh, in the criminal justice system in some uh, other ways, uh, and this is so profoundly racially unequal that it's uh, this, uh, this phenomenon of racialized mass incarceration also garners a lot of attention. And a lot of people uh, say that this, uh, that, at that this phenomenon is at least partly caused by anti-drug laws that are too strong. Okay, so pharmaceutical regulation is too weak, anti-drug laws too strong. Uh, and those harsh drug war laws are also associated with another uh, type of story from the second genre more recently. That is the shift of the opioid crisis from being a crisis of addiction to opioids to being a crisis of overdose fatalities from opioids. And this is also implicated, uh, this, is, uh, this is linked to the restriction of access to pharmaceutical opioids uh, because of two too strict drug laws. So you see these two different kinds of stories. And I want to start by asking or wondering, how did we get here where we have both of these problems at the same time? That our drug laws are, are on the one hand too weak, and our drug laws on the other hand are too strong. Um, now, I'm a historian, and so uh, 
when I think about the, or the causes of this situation, uh, I say that we are here because of an act of forgetting, which is the cardinal sin of my type of person. Uh, we've, we, we have forgotten things that we need to know, and that's how we can get in this kind of nonsensical situation. By the way, this is the Drug Policy Alliance uh, uh, picture on the left. They're one of the ones uh, arguing that drug laws that are too harsh have helped produce this mass incarceration and this crisis of overdose fatalities. So you can see, these are headlines that I just drew from my local newspaper. Uh, today's opioid crisis is usually described as a recent and shocking phenomenon in which addiction left its traditional home among poor, urban, racial minorities and found its way into once wholesome white suburbs. And that's where you see, you probably can't read this, this says, a new breed of addict. Over here it says, new breed of drug dealer. So this is uh, the way that this crisis is framed. It's different than what we've seen in the past. But this story of novelty, of, of newness, is actually uh, not just wrong, but kind of shockingly wrong. This is, a, I'm gonna go through some historical headlines. These are from the 70s. It says, danger, prescription drug abuse, white collar pill poppers, America's new breed of dopers. Uh, these are from the 60s. Goofballs are the new narcotics perils. Pep pills are way of life. The, uh, this is from the 40s. It says, uh, Slaves of the devil's capsules, uh, barbiturates more dangerous than dope. These are from the 30s. Uh, sleeping pills held often lead to dope habit. And this is all the way back to the 1910s. These are headlines from the, from the New York Times. And you can see uh, the problem of addiction to and harms related to use of, of um, psychoactive pharmaceuticals has been going on for a very long time. And if you were to take the time to read these articles, which I have because um, you know that's, that's what I do, you would see that underneath these headlines, for over a century, the same story has been running. This is a shocking new development that we haven't seen before. Addiction has left the place where we expect it to be and cropped up in this new place where we don't expect it to be. Why? There are two types of why that are just really mystifying from this. First, why has addiction to pharmaceuticals been so widespread, so long, just been being reported on constantly for the last century? And second, how is it possible to continually discover this seemingly ever-present phenomenon as if it were something new and shocking? Why this bizarre, long-running national surprise about this phenomenon? Well, today, my plan is to remember this history, to remember America's history of addiction to pharmaceuticals. And uh, the point of doing so, I suggest, is that we'll better understand those, that paradox we started with about the opioid crisis and the drug war and mass incarceration. It'll show that these stories are actually connected. They're part of the same story. And that we're unlikely to solve either one of them unless we understand uh, that, they, that they are, in fact, part of the same story. If we keep seeing them as separate and try to solve them separately. All right, so I'm going to start uh, with the first wave of addiction to pharmaceuticals. And by this, I mean drugs that are produced by the pharmaceutical industry sold through uh, medical channels. The first time that large numbers of Americans became addicted to pharmaceutical drugs was in the late 19th century. It was a result of two broad developments. Technological advances, such as the hypodermic needle, that made drugs easier to take, and the Industrial Revolution that permitted faster and cheaper production of purer, in other words, stronger drugs. So for example, morphine was isolated from uh, opium, and later uh, they added a couple of uh, molecular chains and produced heroin, which uh, Bayer Pharmaceuticals introduced in 1898. And then uh, Park Davis introduced a new drug derived from the coca plant, cocaine, in 1882. With the greater availability of stronger drugs, plus the greater number of injuries from the Civil War, uh, the rate of addiction in the United States skyrocketed through the roof. And when I started doing these lectures, I used to say it reached heights that it never again reached or even came close. Uh, that shows that I've been doing this for a long time, but, it, but it's also uh, to, uh, to make the point that, these were, that this was a lot of people who became dependent on opioids and cocaine. Uh, it, you can't see these figures. This is the max, this is, we have the figures of the total volume of legal uh, of pharmaceutical opioids that were uh, on the market in the U.S. And in 1840, they would have been enough to supply 
people with addiction per 1,000 members of the U.S. population. In 1895, that was 4.6 per 1,000. That's a lot of people, um, especially because that's men, women, and children. So uh, we have the overall number of drugs imported, and we have that there were a lot of people with addiction. Um, how, did it, how did people come to be addicted? Well, a lot of people these days, especially now that there's Google image searches, are familiar with so-called patent medicines, these kind of snake oil things that were for sale in the late 19th century. And a lot of these did have narcotic ingredients. This is Coca-Cola here. It did have cocaine in it. Uh, this is Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup for children teething. It was full of morphine. And these uh, tooth drops were, I mean, they said cocaine tooth drops. So people know about these. But these actually didn't cause or even maintain a lot of cases of addiction, primarily because most of them did not announce that they had a narcotic in them. They, they had secret ingredients, and awareness of what you're using is an important component of addiction. And they also, the narcotics were the expensive ingredient, so there weren't a lot of narcotics in them. And they just had a little bit. So in fact, instead, it was these guys. And when I say these guys, I want to be clear that I don't mean this, this guy. This is, some, uh, this is a random British 19th century physician. What I mean is doctors just giving you an image of a 19th century physician. These guys caused the vast majority of addiction at this time. And because most people with addiction uh, were people who had visited physicians, most of the 19th century folks uh, who were suffering this problem came from what I call the doctor visiting classes, people who had the money to go see a doctor. Uh, so they were white, they were native born, they were women in particular, and they weren't especially rural or urban. If you had to say, you know, uh, David, what's the, if I was going to meet a person with addiction from the 19th century, who's the most likely kind of person I would meet? I would say a farm wife, someone who, you know, worked on a farm. And uh, as the rate of addiction among these people uh, increased, reformers, particularly the first people to notice it were reformers in, within professional medicine, they were horrified and frightened by what they saw, and it was very confusing to them, but they're also deeply sympathetic. They said that these folks, uh, they saw them as innocent victims of a market for drugs that had careened out of control in a uh, rapidly industrializing era. They said, this is, these people have been exposed to a danger, they're innocent victims of this. And so in response to it, uh, medical elites said, okay, we're gonna do a campaign to try to heighten professional standards so that you need more education to be a doctor so people will know better um, and, and doctors can protect people from this problem instead of exposing them to it. And they uh, urged their colleagues to prescribe less opioids, prescribe less cocaine, and don't tell patients what you prescribe for them because at this time they could just take that prescription and keep buying that um, pretty much permanently from the drugstore. So this was the response. We need to regulate this market to protect consumers better. The federal government got directly into the game after expose journalism like this. This says um, uh, Death's Laboratory, the Patent Medicine Trust, Palatable Poison for the Poor. These are these muckrakers, these investigative journalists, expose journalists in the early 20th century. And one of their targets was uh, the narcotics industry. And after these exposes, uh, the federal government, uh, after a campaign by reformers that was kind of based on these things, uh, they helped to pass America's first national consumer protection law, the Food and Drug Act of 1906. Now, the Food and Drug Act, I'm going to be really quick on these slides because they're the, they're the boring ones. Um, the, national, the Food and Drug Act required drug manufacturers to be honest on their label. It didn't require them to say anything in particular, but what you did say had to be true. Um, and they had to list any narcotic ingredients alcohol, cocaine, um, morphine, and it established a new arm of the federal government, the Food and Drug Administration, to enforce those requirements, the first consumer protection law in the United States. Now, notice that this law didn't actually outlaw the sale of any particular thing, okay? Uh, it was not a drug war law designed to quash markets for narcotics. Um, instead, it was designed to make markets for these drugs possible by informing consumers so that they could make safe choices. Harvey W. Wiley, the main reformer guy and the first chief of the FDA, uh, as he told Congress trying to convince them to pass this bill, he said, I just want to make sure that, quote, the innocent consumer may get what he thinks he is buying. Now, 
by the time 1906 has come around, you've had many decades of free-flowing morphine, heroin, cocaine going through primarily medical channels, but there's been a lot of these things going through medical channels. There's just a lot of them around, and unsurprisingly, because there were very few legal limits on where they could be sold, it was tradition, it was practice, it was respectability that they were sold by physicians and not by anybody else, but the legal limitations were, were not that much. Um, these drugs began to get a popular following in non-medical markets, or markets that weren't physicians and pharmacists, informal markets, uh, particularly among the kind of people who couldn't afford to go see a doctor. So people, particularly uh, urban, working class men who purchased the drug from maybe druggists who didn't mind having a bad reputation, or street peddlers in vice districts and cities. And these markets, these informal markets, uh, they became dangerous in the late 19th, early 20th century for the same reason that medical markets became dangerous. A sudden explosion of availability of pure uh, drugs that kind of outpaced the tools that consumers used to try to make safe choices. Um, it wasn't a development that's unique to drugs. In the late 19th century, all the products that people used started to be made by people far away, by big companies, sold in long distances, very difficult to use the traditional tools to understand how I can trust this product. And there were tons of exposés of products in this early industrial revolution that killed people, maimed people, injured people. So if you were to read the newspapers, you might read a terrible story about you know, some child who uh, had uh, been killed by overdose of Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. But on the same page, you might read of uh, a dozen babies who had starved to death while drinking milk, but it was swill milk produced by um, cows uh, whose milk was so watered down because they were being fed beer slops that it had no, tr no nutritional value. Uh, or, um, uh, or women disfigured by toxic cosmetics. This was another big thing that happened all the time. So though all kinds of products were dangerous. Drugs at this time were just one of many uh, that were like this. And these informal markets, just like medical markets, became dangerous at this time. People did not know how to protect themselves from becoming addicted or having some of the harms that can come from being addicted. So there are a lot of parallels between these two different ways, two different places that people bought these drugs and, the, and, and what their experiences were. But the reformers who were observing this and saying, we need to do something about this social problem, uh, they saw these as totally different phenomena. These were not similar things that were happening at all. As a matter of fact, when they looked at these informal markets, they said those are not innocent victims of some market gone out of control, not at all. These people are willful deviants and criminals, and that's why uh, they're doing this. Now, this attitude came partly from class prejudices against the poor. These were poor people, they weren't going to see doctors. Um, but it also was linked strongly to racial stereotypes at the time. You can see here, uh, oh, whoops, this was the slide for that whole, <laughs> that whole last part of the thing I was talking about. These are these informal, this is a New York Times story about those informal markets, and you can see they're portrayed as kind of shady and shifty in this way. Um, you can see here, this is, uh, these are headlines from the early 20th century that says, Negro cocaine fiends are a new southern menace, and it's talking about, um, uh, the propensity, supposed propensity of African American men to be driven to rape white women when they use cocaine, similar headline here. And you can see there are tons of these kind of pictures in, um, in weekly magazines from the late 19th, early 20th century where you have things like this smirking Chinese man kind of luring these white women into an opium den where they would smoke opium and then enter what they called at the time white slavery. And to reformers looking at that, this seemed like a very different world and a very different social problem than women getting morphine from physicians. I gave you my historian's view of saying, well, there are a lot of similarities between what was going on there. To them, a, they would have just been totally flummoxed by what I said. They would have said, these are two totally different phenomena. And so when they said, let's do something about these informal markets, they said, let's do something very different than what we did with the medical markets. They passed a different law, the Harrison Anti-Narcotic Act of 1914. This criminalized the non-medical use of narcotics, which were defined as morphine, heroin, and cocaine, making them America's first prescription-only drugs. And they were the only prescription-only drugs for about a half century after that. And they imposed strong 
controls over the sale of pharmaceutical narcotics, controls that the FDA did not have at the time and in fact has never had. Uh, F the Federal Bureau of Narcotics is a much stronger regulator of the sale of pharmaceuticals than the FDA ever was. And by the end of the 1920s, it established this Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which launched this punitive campaign to arrest and punish so-called junkies and dope fiends. Um, by 1928, narcotics violators, 1928, narcotics violators made up 30% of America's federal prisoners, and people with addiction were so hated and feared that regular prison wardens didn't want them infecting their good, honest prison populations. And so in 1935, this place, the United States Lexington Narcotics Farm, or Narco, was founded to house them. Um, now, this is an amazing thing. The, the, the Lexington, Lexington Narcotics Farm, it was, um, it was a hospital and it was a prison. It was also a working dairy farm. Now bear with me for a minute here. It was a working dairy farm because they believed that milking cows might somehow help these uh, urban uh, drug users become better people and stop using drugs. Now think, think about this for a minute because I just said that the overwhelming majority of people with addiction for most of this era were in fact farmers. But you can see how that social logic was so powerful to them that it never occurred to them that for all they knew, milking cows was a risk factor, <laughs> right? But of course, of course. Uh, so anyway, that kind of just blows my mind every time I think about it again, that they had all these guys from New York City coming to this farm in Kentucky. Um, it's, it's kind of amazing. Okay, so. To summarize here, in response to this first wave, big wave of addiction to pharmaceuticals, the United States government worked uh, with the medical professions to create and formalize, for the first time, really formalize a distinction between medical and non-medical drugs and drug use. Um, before this, that line was fuzzy. After this, it gets firmed up. And, uh, and they developed two separate ways of governing those different kinds of drugs and drug use. On the one hand, <clears throat> you had a relatively weak system of consumer protection based on the Food and Drug Act. It was designed for substances called medicines and the socially favored consumers who were called patients. And the other was a much stronger system of criminal punishment based on the 1914 Harrison Act. And it was designed uh, for drugs called dope and the poorer and increasingly over time non-white uh, consumers known as dope fiends at the time. Now, if you were a historian and you looked at something like this uh, and um, you knew when it happened, like the early 20th century, you'd be like, man, that looks awfully familiar. That looks awfully familiar. Because in the early 20th century uh, was a period of time, you may stretch back to your high school history class or whatever, it, it was the progressive era, the progressive era, right. Th this was an era known for reforms that on the one hand, they were the first ones to decide, they invented the regulatory state. They were the ones that said, capitalism, you know, the industrial revolution, the markets have gone out of control, we need to have somebody at the steering wheel. So they invented the regulation of the economy. So you can see that in there as well. But they were also obsessed, obsessed with economic and racial hierarchies. And so they also invented racial segregation. It was during this period that that was formalized in the South through Jim Crow and in the North through uh, racial covenants, residential segregation and things of this sort. Um, they also, this is the, they were the ones who pursued eugenic sterilization campaigns. Uh, and also they were the ones who pursued and eventually uh, successfully implemented immigration uh, restriction, basically the end of immigration from many countries other than Germany, England, and France for the next half century. So from that perspective, this looks like just another example of that. All right, well you see, this doesn't look like two separate systems of drug control, but it looks like instead a single, unequal, you might even go out on a limb and call it a segregated system that governed Americans' access to psychoactive drugs. Because the substances are the same here, medicines and dope are the same thing, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, that's what they did. And we have the benefit of hindsight. We can now ask, well, how well did it work? Well, this part, uh, this part we know a lot about from history, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I'll just say this, this part offered very little but punishment for people who bought and used drugs in this 
uh, in informal markets and non-medical markets, whatever you want to call them. And uh, the number of people using drugs, experiencing addiction, and suffering all those related harms did not go down. Instead, it, they just, um, the first thing that happened is that they switched to the easiest to smuggle drug possible, so they switched to heroin. There had been a lot of smoking opium and then uh, morphine, but then heroin is the most compact and least smelly. So they switched to a more dangerous drug uh, and, the, and uh, more dangerous forms of use like injection. And then, um, and then their numbers just, they had a steady state. It kind of went up and down with global trade, basically. When there was a lot of global trade, there was a lot of heroin around. And uh, it didn't, doesn't seem to have done anything beneficial, this part. And that's pretty widely known. But this side, this side actually uh, was quite successful in reducing the overall volume of medical opioid sales. I'm going to focus on opioids now because that's what I have the most data about. Um, you can see here, this is ounces of morphine equivalent per capita. I said, I'm not a historian who works with numbers a lot, and this, I'm going to tell you why, because this one graph was like three solid weeks of work. And then usually if you work for three weeks as a historian, you've got like pages and stories and like I, I finished it all and I was like, I have 30 numbers? <laughs> That's a long time to work for this. But this is, the, this is per, per, per year from 1870 to 1987 is on this graph. And you can see that big spike in the, eight, in the late 19th century. And then you can see, look at that. It really went down significantly and then stayed down for a long time. Most impressively, this decline right here, it happened without, as far as I'm able to tell, a corresponding rise uh, in overdose deaths for opioids. So in other words, this was not a situation where people switched from relatively safe pharmaceuticals to relatively unsafe street drugs. So wh how did that happen? Well, the overall reduction in, this is the overall reduction in sales, it actually masks two different trends at this time period. On the one hand, physicians really did stop prescribing for you know, uh, all kinds of very minor forms of ailments. And, you know, they prescribed, they might prescribe heroin for hiccups or for uh, coughing um, or for bedwetting. I mean, it really was a very common thing. And a lot of that did go down. Uh, but it appears that prescribing to people with addiction dropped much more slowly, only uh, as the number of people with opioid addiction slowly declined into the 1950s. So it, it seems, and it's a little bit hard to tell because technically prescribing opioids to someone with addiction was illegal under the Harrison Anti-Narcotic Act, but as far as I can tell, it was a very common practice through this period, and that's what a lot of that prescribing, a lot of those sales represent. Um, now, those sales were to people, um, in general, the farther removed a physician was from the stereotypical setting of a dope fiend situation, like the farther they were removed from a, from a city, from immigrants, from racial minorities, the less likely their prescribing was going to be scrutinized. And so there was this whole large population of people with addiction who were being quietly maintained um, in places like Kentucky and West Virginia, uh, Ohio, um, places that are still in the news, you know, a hundred years later for um, opioid problems. And uh, there was almost nobody studying those places. They just, to people who were paying attention, it just seemed like that kind of person with addiction had just disappeared. And I've only able to find a few pieces of information about it, but as late as 1960, as far as I can tell, Kentucky had America's highest rate of opioid addiction, and it was primarily among native-born white people who were receiving morphine from a physician. So this was a time when the stereotype of a person with addiction would have been uh, an urban, urban jazz musician, for example. But it appears uh, to have been a rural Kentucky family. So what we had here was kind of a natural experiment wherein you had a very similar, you had a similar public health crisis in two different locations, and then they uh, tried two different solutions. They, you know, in one place they applied one solution, in the other place they applied another. And in formal markets, they imposed this punitive form of prohibition. Doesn't seem to have worked all that well. And in the medical markets, on the other hand, were governed by um, what looked like a limited, very constrained and profoundly unequal, and we can talk about this more in Q&A if you like, of what, m what later would be called harm reduction. That, in other words, drugs continued to be available, 
but only with robust consumer protections and health care for people who were hurt despite those protections. So in other words, in this experiment, it, it looks to me, in hindsight, when I'm looking at it, it looks like it has a really clear outcome, like we saw, I saw what worked and I saw what didn't. But authorities at the time, they misread this experiment. Instead of thinking that that consumer protection model was good policy, they thought it had succeeded only because it had been applied to good people. So those good white farm wives, for example, they had uh, been informed by the Food and Drug Act, oh, that has narcotics in it, and they decided to stop once they were fully informed of the risks, like a rational person, in theory, would, would be supposed to. Meanwhile, those poorer and racially uh, stigmatized consumers in informal markets, they seem to just continue willfully and purposefully to do it, even though by then they should have known that it was wrong and dangerous and so on and so forth, despite all these efforts to get them to stop. And this was helped by the fact that the medical market people who were still experiencing addiction, they were getting uh, kind of quietly prescribed by physicians spread out all over the place, not a bunch in any one place. Whereas in cities, you had a whole bunch of people in one place. They kept showing up in prisons, in charity hospitals, so they were really visible. And so to people at the time who were paying attention to this, they just thought, well, you know, if you're working with decent people, you can do this kind of decent approach, but those other people obviously you know, they're, they're a lost cause. This misreading turned out to have very bad consequences. Um, and it helped lead to a second and even larger and even more devastating wave of addiction to pharmaceuticals. And in this case, with different drugs. The drugs were um, sedatives and stimulants, barbiturates and amphetamines. Um, barbiturates were first introduced in 1906. You can see here Virenol. The tagline for its advertisement is above the clouds. <laughs> and uh, amphetamine was introduced in the 1930s with Benzedrine. Here, uh, that guy looks like he's ready to go to work. Um, and their use of these drugs really took off after the Harrison Act restricted medical use of morphine and cocaine by doctors. So you can see here blue is, uh, blue is opioids, and this is per capita. Uh, annual daily doses, you can see that it goes down. And right when the blue reaches its bottom part, you see a, an uptick, first with uh, the barbiturates become available, and then uh, with amphetamine. And by the end, by 1960, it's dwarfing what was happening in the late 19th century. You'll not be surprised to learn that all of this use of these drugs, which can be addictive and which can be toxic, and uh, in the case of barbiturates, um, withdrawal symptoms are, are far more dangerous than with opioids or cocaine, uh, led to a catastrophic, I mean, in a catastrophic crisis of epidemic, of, of, uh, of addiction and overdose. Between 1933 and 1953, the fatal uh, rate of fatal barbiturate overdoses rose from a little under two to a little under eight per 100,000. That may not, that number may not mean a lot, but for comparison's sake, the death rate of, for prescription opioids in 2017 was only a little over five. Now, for all opioids, it was, um, uh, it was here at 13.3. But even so, in 1953, there was a severe public health crisis of people dying of barbiturate overdoses. Now, because barbiturates are not derived from plants, amphetamines are not derived from plants, there were no, um, there were no informal markets for these drugs as of yet. They were all had to be made by a pharmaceutical company and so they were only available through pharmacies for the most part. And that meant that, just like in the late 19th century, the people using all these drugs and the people dying from them were these you know, doctor visiting classes. Again, the same kind of people uh, from the late 19th century. And the result was in situations uh, like what happened in the tiny town of Keele, Wisconsin. I point it out because when you think about, uh, well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it used to be when, when when I first started teaching about drug and alcohol history, I would show slides like this because I wanted to say, if you want to talk about the history of drugs in America, you need to talk about little towns you've never heard of, not New York City, not Chicago. But now, of course, that, that's become something that people are much more familiar with. At any rate, Keele, Wisconsin. One physician there uh, was discovered to be prescribing very large volumes of uh, amphetamines. And the state medical board so much that they brought him in for questioning, like, hey, you know, what are you doing here? 
And in res I've looked at the transcript of their interview with him, and he was quite open and quite proud of his prescribing practices. He said, well, I prescribe amphetamines to make patients feel a little peppier or to help a woman keep up with the housework. Sometimes he said, I give them a prescription because they're paying for an office call and they want relief. They don't want you to say, go home and take two aspirins. But he said, look, you don't need to worry because my town doesn't have any black market for drugs. At least, he said, nothing like the city. Because this is somewhere near uh, Milwaukee in a couple cities. And I'm looking, I'm there in the archives, you know, thinking, oh my God, like, of course there is no black market in your town. You are selling everybody all the drugs they could possibly want. Why would there be a black market in your town? Like, you're, anyone who comes in your door walks away with whatever they want. But so you can see that his, but his logic was, there's no problem in my town. I'm selling to these good people who need them for reasons that you approve of. These aren't addictive people. It, it's not a problem, not like in the city. And, you know, the, the medical board was, they said, well, try to tone it down, but they did nothing about the guy <laughs> because it wasn't illegal. A and his logic was, you know, th they, they agreed with it. And this is just one story of hundreds. I, I spent years, I, I called it my naughty doctor's tour. I was going from uh, the state archives of records of <laughs> doctors who'd been investigated and uh, convicted of various kinds of things, um, very eye-opening. <laughs> experience tons of these things, right? Uh, because this was very common practice. So in other words, this one of these kinds of markets for drugs, I said, was called medical markets, right? And, and when you call a market medical, it has a couple of consequences. On the one hand, it could be used to uh, uh, implement these pretty successful, effective policies as had been implemented to pharmaceutical opioids. I talked about those, but it turns out that it could also be used to shield dangerous drug commerce from regulation that really needed to happen to protect people because it could downplay or ignore the risk of addiction uh, as it had happened with barbiturates and amphetamines. This, I mean, you can't ignore that number of deaths and um, by the end of World War II, there was an effort to do something about barbiturates and amphetamines. You can see these are just headlines from newspapers at that time. This has got the slaves of the devil's capsules. This is knocked asleep. There were lots of slaves of the devil's capsules. I don't know why that phrase really um, hit, struck a note with people in the late 40s, but it appears to have. Um, and so they tried, they tried to uh, get Congress to pass a law that would restrict the sale of these drugs in some way similar to the way that the Harrison Act had introduced robust regulation of opioids and cocaine. But it was no luck. They, it couldn't work because these stories, um, they didn't have, uh, they weren't able to build a wide enough political coalition. You could get a co coalition to really robustly regulate opioids because you could bring along all these people who were terrified of the urban underclasses and freed slaves in the South, and they would hop on board because they would say, oh, well, you're doing something I want to do too. Here, the, the power of this medical, non-medical divide meant that you were just a bunch of liberals who wanted to regulate business. And, you know, in the 1950s, that wasn't, um, that wasn't a, a, a big selling point. There wasn't a lot of political oomph for that. But, so this went on. Like, 1953 had that number of deaths. Those number of deaths went up significantly because in the 50s you also had Milltown, uh, another tranquilizer, and then Valium. Valium was the most pre prescribed drug in the world in 1973. There were 100 million prescriptions sold every year in America alone. It was number one on all of the, uh, on all of the lists of drug overdose deaths. So that 1953 number just kept getting bigger and yet nothing was done about it. Nothing was done in the 50s, 40s. Nothing was done in the 50s. Nothing was done through most of the 60s as well. The problem just kept getting bigger and worse. It took uh, two um, broad political and cultural changes in the later 60s and 70s that led to a, an opening to do something about this problem. The first was civil rights activism by women and African Americans, and they challenged this cultural logic that helped justify treating medical and non-medical drug users so differently. We're accustomed to thinking about that system as harming non-medical drug users, and it did. It arrested them instead of caring for them, you know, did all these problematic things, but it also harmed medical drug users too by not uh, by pretending that somehow, well, because you're good people, there's no risk for you of taking these these kinds of drugs. And so these guys challenged that logic. They helped authorities to see, on the one hand, non-white 
poorer urban drug users more sympathetically. Maybe these people are humans after all. And they also highlighted the problems of women who, after all, were the ones most commonly going to doctors and were the ones most exposed to addiction to these drugs. And both of these things made it more possible to recognize parallels, see similarities between behaviors in the medical and the non-medical worlds. So that was one development. The second development was uh, the emergence of the modern consumer movement. This was a, a new political coalition that was pushing to protect consumers by building muscular state capacity to regulate markets in the name of consumer protection. Um, and you can see here Ralph Nader's book on safe at any speed. There was also a major congressional inquiry into the drug industry under Senator Estes Kefauver that um, produced uh, reforms to try to rein in the drug industry. And then uh, starting with John Kennedy's White House conference to rethink American drug policy in 1962 and culminating in Richard Nixon's uh, Controlled Substances Act, new consumer protection laws remade pharmaceutical commerce in America. Um, I'm just gonna, oops, I'm gonna try to make this one go fast. The, the, key, the, uh, the key thing that the Controlled Substances Act did is it, is imp it imposed very stringent regulations on pharmaceutical companies and other large market actors like uh, physicians who did most of the prescribing, of course. Uh, so on the one hand, it, it applied strong controls to the market, but on the other hand, um, Nixon called it a war on drugs. This was in part a way to sell it. The actual appropriations contained more money for drug treatment, including methadone uh, for people with opioid addiction than it did for enforcement. Um, so in other words, in some ways, uh, this law rebuilt that the, the effective part of that first experiment I talked about, uh, cons that consumer protection style combined with healthcare for people who were harmed despite the protections. And it, but it, for the first time, it was extended a little bit beyond medical users. Methadone was a treatment primarily designed for uh, non-medical drug users. Now, I'll be the last person to go all in on defending Richard Nixon's drug policies. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A, but this aspect of it, his, his policies towards the pharmaceutical industry are actually really very interesting and much stronger than I think is commonly known. And as a matter of fact, the law was unambiguously successful. You can see I've extended this graph, and after reaching that height, um, the sales of sedatives and stimulants start to go down pretty dramatically. Uh, they plummeted by as much as 50% even as at the same time, the number of emergency rooms dropped by an even larger amount. So once again, this was not restrict the supply of safe drugs and then people go and die using unsafe drugs. Somehow, these restrictions happened and uh, at the same time as an improvement in the public health. Now, <coughs> excuse me, not everyone was happy about these changes in the 70s. Some people saw this, uh, particularly people who had been privileged customers of medical markets for a long time, they saw this as another entitlement that had been lost to big government in the era of civil rights and feminism. So for example, an Arizona man, he wrote to his congressman in 1973, he says, I suppose I could be considered one of the silent majority. Uh, one by one, they're disappearing our freedoms down the bureaucratic drain. Like, why can't I buy my drugs anymore? Another woman wrote directly to the FDA. I feel that my rights as a citizen of the United States has been infringed upon. Whatever happened to free enterprise, or do we really have something else? Uh, a Wisconsin man wrote to his state representative, but the wife must have these to live a decent life. He was complaining that he could no longer buy amphetamine pills in batches of a thousand, because they're cheaper to buy them in batches of a thousand. He says, you know, she needs these. So, all of these letters, and I found a bunch of them in different places, they shared the, this instantly recognizable rhetoric of the so-called silent majority. These were uh, white voters who were courted by Richard Nixon through appeals to their lost status in the face of the civil rights movement and other social changes of the era. They were the sign, they were the first inklings of this newly emerging conservative political coalition that was gonna soon bring an end to this brief moment of drug law reforms and would reestablish the moral divide between drugs and medicines. On the one hand, starting with the Rockefeller drug laws uh, in New York State, where I'm from, end of 1973, uh, law and order politicians across the country competed to pass the harshest laws against sale and use of drugs in non-medical settings. This process culminated in the mid-1980s with a scare over smokable so-called crack cocaine. 
and that helped produce an era of mass incarceration so racially disparate that some have taken to calling it the new Jim Crow. On the other hand, uh, as President Reagan implemented deregulation of American markets, the pharmaceutical industry rebounded uh, from the 1970s drop with new, um, with new sedatives like Halcyon and Xanax, new stimulants like Adderall, and of course, new narcotics like OxyContin all of which were hyped as technological miracles that had solved the old problems of addiction for the kinds of people uh, who, uh, who now looked much less likely to be susceptible to addiction now that the public face of addiction was crack smoking central city racial minorities. So in other words, by the time you get into the 90s, there was a sh another sharp and massive rise in drug use divided between relatively lightly controlled medicines provided preferentially to people with privileged access to the medical system, with all the uh, class, gender, and racial implications of that in this country. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, punitively pun punished drugs that the location of the markets was primarily in central city neighborhoods, although their consumer base could be much larger than that. So uh, this, is the, this is the conclusion. I'm impressed you all have, uh, have made it this far. I'm, I'm almost done. It's not an accident that the rhythms of this story, the overall rhythms, uh, major changes happen at the same time in both stories. Because pharmaceutical policy and drug war policy have been evolving in tandem for over a century. And this is because they're part of the same story. And I'm sorry, I suspect that this slide would not, uh, is not visible. Um, you can't read it from back there. But there's the, you can see these are major laws about for pharmaceuticals on the top and major laws and the drug war on the bottom, and you can see the Food and Drug Act and the Harrison Act at one moment. You have the, uh, an important law, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in 1938. The Marijuana Tax Act of 1938 happened in the, in the same year, sorry, 37, pretty much the same year. Then you have the uh, 1970 Act was re relevant for both of them. And then uh, you have these incredibly draconian anti-crack uh, drug law, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, happening at the same time as they say, we'll go ahead and advertise pharmaceuticals to the general public. You don't have to only do them to physicians. That's literally the same year uh, that these things happen. So in this story, the worst periods have been those with a deep racialized division between medical and non-medical drug use. In these periods, pharmaceutical companies enjoy relatively free hand to market dangerous and addictive medicines, uh, even as Non-medical drug users must navigate illegal markets with dangerous products and authorities tasked with punishing rather than protecting them. Uh, and these problems are related. Weak regulations of the pharmaceutical industry help enable or encourage popular markets for drugs that in turn, they declare drug wars to try to rein them in. So in other words, it didn't really work, historically speaking, to carve out some drug consumers as worthy of protection and care while seeing others as deviants and criminals who need to be punished. This way of approaching it always ensured that the next epidemic was brewing, getting ready to go, even as we handled the current one, right? To escape the trap, I think uh, we need to see our way beyond a system of drug control that was quite frankly built right alongside racial segregation in this country 100 years ago. Most of, the, most of those kind of formations uh, that were built during that time period have evolved over time. We've rethought them. We've thought, you know, how do I get what's good out of this but have it continue to evolve along with our values as a society? This drug medicine divide is somehow has escaped that kind of critical scrutiny. Um, but only by rethinking that, can we bridge this gap between consumer advocates who are saying we need stricter drug laws to rein in big pharma and drug war reformers who are saying we need radical deregulation of drug markets, it's the punishment and control that's hurting people. Both of these people can actually be right. Uh, people who use drugs deserve a safe and robustly regulated market and the best possible care if they are harmed despite those protections. But this goal can only be reached if we reimagine drug policy categories that we've inherited without maybe thinking as carefully about them as we should from a century ago. Thank you. <laughs> and there's, I, I don't know what time it is. I certainly hope that we have time for questions. That's, that's wonderful. So.
Um, let's have a moment of awkward silence and then some questions. I lost it? Oh, really? Sorry. Was I, was I loud enough? Whoa. <laughs> it's on. Oh, but it's not on. Huh. Well, I guess I better shout. I'll, uh, I apologize. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> Yes. Oh, it was right behind you. I what about treatment? Uh, what about, what about? Treatment. Okay, so you mean um, anything, I mean, I don't want to go on and talk a lot about things that are not what you mean. What, what specifically about treatment would you like to know? Well, Right. Yeah, and one of the things that they've done in Burlington, one of the centerpieces of that is that when people show up in, a, in any setting where they are asking for help uh, with uh, problems related to their drug use, there's been a, a decrease in the barriers to providing the, the only medical treatment that has been shown to dramatically reduce fatalities, which is uh, medication-assisted therapy, or there's a bunch of different words for it, but things like buprenorphine or methadone, and you can, you can get that um, in Burlington, I mean, many of you probably know better than I do, and in a number of places in Vermont, you can get that right away instead of being told, okay, we'll put your name on a list, and then maybe four weeks from now, you can get this treatment. And from the point of view of, of policy, or it, and if you think about it, uh, drug markets, um, this means, this is an instance in which uh, there needs to be greater access to these drugs because that's what will help people um, j not just survive but help people achieve other kind of life goals that they've got. Um, but, it's, uh, but it's not necessarily the kind of access that the pharmaceutical companies have most enjoyed, right? It's, it's, a, it's an access that they don't, they don't like to be associated with addiction at all. It, they, they don't like that for their reputation. And so it's, a, it's one of these cases where you can only pursue that policy if you stop, uh, if you, if you stop thinking in terms of these categories of, of medicines and drugs. Because so like, what is what, what are we going to call buprenorphine provided in this in this setting? Well, I mean, obviously it's a medicine that's being prescribed and it's there to to help somebody, but it's uh, but if we if we limit that its availability to people that we see as patients, like someone who has decided that they uh, share the same life goals that we do, so a moral question rather than a medical one, then we end up restricting it in ways that, that cause a lot, of, um, a lot of harm. So uh, this is relatively, um, this is one of these things that, um, that, is, that is unique about the present moment that these kinds of strategies uh, are being much more widely applied than they have been in the past, and they have much more political muscle behind them than they have in the past. And, and I, it's my hope that, um, that the idea of treatment will come out of this period expanded so that it can include more types of actions like this that are really focused on public health and not on moral questions that seem odd to have in the hands of a doctor uh, or in the medical system. Yes. I, I know absolutely nothing about this subject. Uh, so I don't know this is something once you take in these pills, mm -hmm. do you then is there a pill to <coughs> get rid of it? How long do you take? What does it cost? Which pills uh, which pills are you do you mean any of them or any of them? Well, uh, boy, that's a big question. Um, there's, so I, I talked about three different kinds of addictive medicines, and it, they, uh, each of them take a different amount of time to produce um, the kind of experiences that we've labeled addiction or dependence, and uh, it really varies by the person uh, in terms of how 
how you can or whether you can find your way out of that situation of, of um, needing to use that, continuing to use that drug. Um, and there's a lot of debate about whether that, whether that should be the goal, that whether, whether the goal should be to have someone stop using the pill or the drug altogether or to try to create a situation where their use can be safe and they can do the things that people like to do, have families and jobs and enjoy their days. So I don't know if I got what you were getting at, but does that get somewhere near it? <laughs> well, yes, that, that's definitely true. I mean, it looks like somebody has one of them, yes. Following up, is there a safe usage? Is there a safe usage? And yes, there is a safe usage. Yeah, there, there, there can, yes, is there a safe usage? There can be. There's no doubt that, these, that, it, that it's dangerous, okay? Uh, I always think, in, when I think of this, I think about uh, automobiles because they're incredibly dangerous, but we've decided that we need to have a lot of them. Uh, I just drove one seven and a half hours uh, today to get here myself. And, we've, and so we've done all of these things to make uh, our constant use of these incredibly dangerous things as safe as possible. We have rumble strips and airbags and we have inspection of every car that's produced to make sure that it meets all these specifications. You can do that also with drugs. Uh, we haven't, um, we've only every once in a while tried to do that and we've only tried to do that with drugs that we call pharmaceuticals. But so for example, uh, um, people who are pioneers in trying to, f trying to help uh, find safe use, they'll do things like they have um, testing strips so that if you have some drugs that you purchased not from a pharmacy, you purchased them from the street and you don't know what they are, and so it could be quite dangerous to put them into your system, There's, uh, they are uh, quick and inexpensive ways that you can, uh, you can test them to see what's in them, and then when you use them, it's you, you will be able to um, make a safe choice about how to do that and not, for example, uh, discover that there's fentanyl in it and so uh, you've used more than your system can allow. I, I think that, um, you know, if you were to, uh, there's, there's never going to be anything, uh, any kind of drug use that's completely safe. They are dangerous. And addiction is something that, um, in general, people would rather not experience than, than to experience it. Um, but within, you know, within that, you can certainly, it is possible to use these drugs safely over long periods of time. There were uh, a lot of those late 19th century people with opioid addiction. Some of them, actually a very large number of them were physicians. Some of them America's most prominent physicians who had very long careers. Uh, in which they were injecting morphine the entire time. So it's possible if you have the knowledge and the protections and the care uh, to do that. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, he, he's, uh, well, I don't know, it's an, it's an observation uh, that he's talking about, I mentioned the, the new Jim Crow, some people were calling mass incarceration the new Jim Crow, and he was saying some, uh, Michelle Alexander, among others, has argued that one of the reasons that, um, you know, I'm describing, I described the, uh, the Harrison Act punitive side of this as a ineffective drug policy, and he's saying, well, some people say that drug policy is really effective if what you want to do is make sure that black people can't vote. It's working really well. And uh, it, th this is, um, from a functionalist point of view, if you're going to start with the end and say, well, that's the reason that it happened, you know, it's very hard to deny that 
uh, anti-drug laws have been one among a number of different things that have helped to ensure that there's a lot of people who um, don't get paid a lot when they work, either because they're working in prisons and getting paid 30 cents a month, uh, or uh, people who can't vote. There's, there's no denying that. Um, I don't know how far I want to get into the weeds here, but one of the things that, one of the questions, I'm just, a, I'm like in the last stages of writing the book that this is from, and so I'm obsessively thinking about this, and one of the, one of the questions that keeps uh, posing itself uh, is, is it possible to get strong regulation of drug markets without having a boogeyman to demonize as some kind of evil dope pusher so that you can get the people that, that want, who's, that's their social agenda. We want, say, black people not to vote. If, that's the, if, you, if you can't get votes from them, can you get enough votes in Congress for a really strong and robust regulation of, say, the pharmaceutical industry? And, um, and I realize, you know, I'm not sure I've seen an example of it. All the really strong drug laws were from a coalition of liberals who wanted to regulate the drug industry and kind of um, uh, cultural crusaders who were trying to protect what they understood to be traditional America against these foreign or racialized threats. And when they, when they were both on the same side, they passed these really strong laws that were, that were good at restricting the sale of legal drugs but had all these destructive consequences for everybody else. So I don't know, uh, it's an interesting question um, to what extent that intent drives this story and to what extent that's been, um, uh, I guess that's been one ingredient among many. Yeah. So he asks, is there, is there, a, um, is there an example somewhere else in the globe uh, uh, where policies haven't been hobbled by the same kind of weird racial dynamics that, that you tend to see in, in American history? And this is actually really interesting because for most of the 20th century, the rest of the world basically had the United States' as drug policy because the United States made them. Uh, after, particularly after World War II, you know, if you wanted to play, you, this is one of the things you had to do. You had to adopt the American style of regulation. And starting back in 1909, the United States pushed hard to have every country develop laws that se separated drugs and medicines and to define medicines according to what the United States believed medicine was. So if you had a, uh, a shaman who used a particular drug therapeutically in your country, if it wasn't something an American doctor recognized, it was going to be illegal in international law. But in the last, like, 10 or 15 years, that's actually been changing, and you have uh, a proliferation of, of really different drug laws in different countries. The classic example here uh, would be Portugal. Portugal is a, an incredibly homogenous nation. They don't have a lot of the, the, these kinds of ethno-racial conflicts that we have. They legalized all drugs. Um, I can't remember exactly how many years ago. It may have been 10, uh, may have been uh, a little more. So they legalized all drugs, uh, and they spent all of their money that they appropriated for drug policy on um, trying to make drug markets safe and trying to protect uh, and trying to care for people who were harmed uh, by using drugs, people with addiction, et cetera, et cetera. And the consequences there have been kind of um, baffling. Drug use has gone down, and crime has gone down, and deaths have gone down. Um, I don't think anybody would have predicted that drug use itself would go down. That I, it certainly doesn't make sense to me. I don't know why that would be the case, but that's what uh, the evidence says. Um, then, there are other, then there are other less clear examples, like in France, um, up until about 2006, they were the closest to the U.S. in absolutely prohibiting all drug use, punishing uh, all transactions and everything, and then they had a massive turnaround in France because they're such a strong national central government, once the national government decided we're going to do this differently, they basically require buprenorphine treatment 
as this is a, to provide a, a um, the, one of the most effective long-lasting opioids to provide it to people with opioid addiction. This is pretty much the only treatment available in France. Almost everyone is required to receive it if you uh, get any kind of treatment uh, for opioid addiction to the point that people who want to, uh, you know, there are some people who actually would prefer to stop using opioids altogether. They can't get assistance for doing that because it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not illegal, but it's certainly, they can't find a physician who, that's not considered therapy, I guess. And, and in that case, um, you have uh, problems with buprenorphine starting to be uh, diverted from treatment systems, and there are problems with injection use, and so on and so forth. So the, the data aren't totally clear across the globe, except for one big broad thing, uh, which is that, this may not surprise you, but if you, um, allow dangerous and unregulated goods to circulate and then allow people to use them and then punish them uh, if you catch them, this isn't good for them in general. So in places where, in, in places, you know, the, the closer you get to that model, the more harm and damage you get. I, I think um, Russia, we will find out more, uh, you know, as data becomes available, that seems like, uh, an area with really big problems um, in that regard. And in places that are further away from that, I think in, um, in the Netherlands, they for many years have had, I believe it's correct, literally zero cases of HIV transmission from injection drug use for a number of years, uh, which is you know, an astonishing accomplishment and the kind of thing that, uh, that people, um, you know, that, that we should be paying attention to when we're trying to learn from other, other countries. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So he says, what's the role of the states here? It, it, because I, I've been forefronting national policy, that's the place where it's the easiest to lobby because, you know, uh, you have one location, your prey are all in one building. Um, so in terms of the pharmaceutical industry, national is the only game in town because they, they usually, before these national laws, um, I, could, I, could, I could give a whole other talk. I have another 45 minutes about the state and local laws. <laughs> um, the, they, they tried to do it at the state level, but I mean, there, there's just simply no way to control a market like that if, for example, so in, the, in 1955, in, when there were all those barbiturate deaths, there were state laws that restricted barbiturate sales. So let's say you wanted to enforce that state law. You had to prove that the drug was um, that particular drug had been um, bought and sold within the boundaries of your state. And what if it had been made in another state? Was it covered by the law? And then if the FDA tried to, tried to um, do something about those sales, they would have to prove that, that, that that particular pill, before someone swallowed it, had crossed a state line for them to have jurisdiction. So before you have national laws, there's no way to regulate the pharmaceutical industry at the state level. What you can regulate at the state level and cannot regulate at the federal level is doctors. Uh, I mean, and this may be, it's possible, this is changing now in this era of like mass information available everywhere, but for all, all the time periods I've been studying, doctors were regulated by um, state medical boards, by medical societies, and um, they were uninterested in having the federal government intrude on their professional authority. And so uh, at the beginning of the opioid crisis, for example, one of the reasons why the pharmaceutical companies were able to sell so many opioids is one of their strategies was to infiltrate um, state medical boards and other professional societies so that the, the Federation of State Medical Boards, a national organization that represents all the various state medical boards, this organization received a ton of money 
from Purdue and other companies, and they, they set out the guidelines that state medical boards, which have the power to give or take away your license, they changed their policies from way back in the, at the turn of the 20th century, their, their guidelines were prescribe as few opioids as possible. They were probably even too restrictive, too careful about it for a long, long time. They changed their policies not just to be, it's okay to do that, but they started to say things like, you might be investigated if people complain that you're not prescribing them opioids. You could literally be sanctioned as a physician for not uh, following standards of care in some situations if you weren't providing a lot of opioids. And so this, this was taking place not at the national level, but at the state level. Uh, um, I mean, it was also taking place in the wrong at the national level, but this is particularly important for physicians um, who've been really successful at resisting being governed by the federal government. Yes. Is any of these waxing and waning of, of more restrictions in, in any of the period, has, have there, any of these had as high a death rate as the current opioid crisis? I mean, basically we're killing a whole Vietnam War's worth of yeah. people every year. And in the 1900s, some of those, were, were the death rate or the damage rate comparable even to the percentage? You know, it's interesting, the 19th century, there was not a lot of death. There was a lot of addiction, but there wasn't a lot of death. And that's because they weren't illegal. So you had, I mean, people, people did die. People with addiction had shorter lifespans than people without addiction, but everybody had shorter lifespans than today. This is before germ theory. You know, you were dying of tuberculosis. Uh, you were dying of um, communicable diseases of all kinds. And so addiction, uh, you know, was one of the many Yeah. I mean, to me, I, I compare it to the British selling opiates to the Chinese. Sure. To me, that's the only comparable thing that I can Yeah, the only thing I would say is that, is that, um, I'll go back to this, this slide here, where is it? That um, barbiturates and tranquilizers. This is now, um, this is the death rate for barbiturates in 1953. You're going to go up. Uh, my guess is that by the time you hit, let's say, 1969, I would, I would bet, and I don't have these figures on me, but I would bet that the death rate combined from benzodiazepine tranquilizers like Valium, amphetamines uh, at the time, this would have still been Dexedrine, Benzedrine, uh, Ritalin was also available, and um, what was left of the barbiturates, I'll bet you you would have been in the same ballpark. Um, well, this is an unprecedented order of magnitude of death. It's, it's, I mean, in the, in the, there's, it, it, we've been in this ballpark before. There's a lot of complexities to it, but um, we've been in the ballpark before. And, uh, and that's one of the things that, that I think is important to recognize about it because if we, if we look at that narrative that, that I started with from the newspapers of like, this is this new thing, we've never seen these kind of people using these kinds of drugs before, then we, we say, you know, Vermont is known among, among uh, drug policy wonks, like Vermont has a, has a very good reputation for uh, having been a place that's thought really seriously about this problem and is doing uh, a better job than most uh, in response to it. So let's say that um, uh, we try to understand why it's working in Vermont. Uh, and there's two possible explanations. One is that Vermont is doing these sensible policies, like you brought up earlier, of low barrier access to buprenorphine and these kind of things. But we could also say, well, gee, you know, Vermont is one of the whitest states in the United States. Maybe these are just like people who are, you know, well-behaved people who, when you, when you do this kind of thing, maybe we could make the same misinterpretation that we keep making in history again and again of, uh, of, um, of seeing this, seeing what's happening when there's an explosion of harm amongst, um, you know, respectable folks to say that this is somehow a, a unique phenomenon that we'll address uniquely, and then few that's over will go on, rather than seeing it as basically, you know, like a human problem. It's a, 
we, we organize the circulation of goods through markets and we're humans so we, human life involves a lot of suffering. Drugs can help us handle that suffering and you combine all these things together and you know, we're just gonna always have problems with this because they're dangerous, we like to use them and they're profitable. So I, I try without, tr without wanting to at all detract from the magnitude of the tragedy uh, and the crime that, uh, that is befalling the United States now, I don't want to belittle that at all, but I want to emphasize that it's just the latest iteration of a basic problem of how we think about this. No, this is, this is only prescription opioids. So if you were, the number for all opioids, including oh, fentanyl is 13, it's 13.3. So it's almost twice barbiturates in 1953. Oh, okay. So it's significantly higher. Yeah. Um, but once again, uh, this also got much worse over the next decade or two. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, so the question is why, what, what motivated this change in the 1980s where they let drugs be marketed directly to the public? Uh, I was just lecturing on this in my history survey class. Um, this is, uh, this is one part of a, the political philosophy comes with, a, or economic philosophy, it comes with a lot of different names depending on whether you like it or not. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna name it because there's no uh, neutral name for it. But the idea that, um, that if you want to uh, have goods circulate in the best possible way, the only way to do that properly is with a market because individual market actors, if you take them in large numbers, their decisions will be smart in a way that any central actor like a government is inevitably, can't possibly know enough to uh, make all those decisions, is susceptible to lobbyists and special interests because they're all collected. And so what you really need to do is say, take the decision making out of Washington and return it to everyday transactions. And this is, and so this happens in medicine just like in everything else. The idea that if you wanna, that, that um, you need to unleash the power of those markets to be smarter than the government. De deregulation, yeah. And, this is, and it's not just in, uh, in, in marketing directly to the public. Uh, there's a very, um, the FDA approval process during this period is, um, they come under enormous pressure to speed up their approval process. Uh, uh, candidate Ronald Reagan accused them of, of killing um, hundreds of thousands of, the FDA of killing hundreds of thousands of people every year uh, because of their uh, being so slow to approve life-saving drugs. And so they come under enormous pressure to do it faster. One of the ways they do this is they have this thing called accelerated review uh, in which the FDA and representatives of the drug companies get together and they work together to get the drug through the process. And they stop funding that process through the federal government. It's funded by a fee uh, to drug companies, so they're now you have regulators who are being paid by the people that they're regulating in rooms uh, under a lot of pressure to get it done quickly. Uh, and you can see how this could be susceptible to the kind of abuses that, that produced um, OxyContin. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.